This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. I want to continue uh, some uh, analysis of uh, this circulation of uh, uh, value-creating capacity uh, within a capitalist system. Uh, and my objective here is uh, to take up the whole kind of question of political consciousness and political subjectivity and how that forms. Now, I've uh, talked about uh, this issue before, so I, I'll remind you very briefly about the way in which Marx understands uh, the notion of individualism, private property, and the like. Marx does not imagine that somehow or other an idea of private property and an idea of individualism descended from heaven and then people adopted it and uh, off uh, we went. He does not uh, accept the, the fiction uh, that uh, individuals, you know, the world began with individuals <clears throat> and therefore there's something called the natural right of individuals. But individuals then at some point or other came together to form a collectivity and made a social compact, create states and all the rest of it, and, and could create uh, society. Marx does not accept that. Basically what, he's, what he suggests is that certain practices emerge and they can be practices of various kinds, and, and the, but these practices, if they become uh, long-standing practices, and general practices, uh, start to actually create uh, a, a sort of mental world around those practices which reflect the basic qualities of those practices. So the classic case where Marx does this is to kind of say, well, where did the theory of individualism come from? It came, it said, from the emergence of practices of exchange. Exchange first between different communities and communers and all the rest of it, but practices of exchange which step by step uh, led to individuals to be making exchanges. And, and again, there have been exchanges of various kinds, but at a certain point, people started to exchange things called commodities. Uh, before that, they might exchange favors, they might exchange, uh, you know, even people. Uh, one of the forms of exchange which existed way back was the exchange of women. Uh, so there are various forms, of, but Marx does this to kind of say, well, at some point or other, we started to see this system of commodity exchange. And commodity exchange, if, as it evolved, it eventually created uh, a world in which uh, a theory of the individual and of individual rights and individual re re reciprocities and equality of exchange and eventually private property and all the rest of it. Uh, it was the practices of exchange which gave rise uh, to a whole kind of uh, theory. What Marx then argues is that, well, once the theory becomes established uh, and it, it itself becomes a material force in historical change, so that the, the theory then actually, instead of it being created uh, out of practices, the theory starts to come back to dominate the practice. And at that point, it seems as if we live in a world where ideas dominate. Well, but Marx then says that's not historically true. And in fact, it's not even really true because if the practices which gave rise to the theory disappear, then at some point or other, the theory will itself dis disappear entirely. Now, what are the practices which the worker encounters in these five moments of, of, of in the circulation process of labor. And one of the arguments I want to make is that the experience in each one of these moments is radically different. And if experience gives rise to ideas, the question immediately arises as to what the experience of being in this moment does in terms of the person there, what kind of ideas they get, and how are those ideas different from what they get in the next moment, which may be different from the other moment and the next moment or the next moment, and how do they put it all together? In other words, I'm going to end up, see where I'm going perhaps, 
uh, with the idea that the working person is likely to have a confusion of multiple ideas about the world because they're experiencing the world in multiply different ways depending upon which moment of this total circulation process they are in and how powerfully significant that moment is in their lives. Now, I already mentioned that initially at least, and but certainly in, in economic theory, uh, the labor market is imagined as being individualized. That as individuals, we go into the labor market and we seek uh, to get a job. Now, that doesn't have to be the case. If people are very class conscious, they're likely to say, oh, we don't like the, you know, that individual competition which goes on in the labor market uh, is very negative. I mean, it leads people to sort of denigrate each other. It leads to lack of solidarities. It leads to, uh, you know, me uh, 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 dissing uh, my competitors, uh, denigrating them, uh, saying, well, you can't hire that person. That, you know, uh, if I can set a, a thing around that, uh, all, all, all these uh, you know, white workers are arrogant, nasty people, and therefore don't employ them. Uh, employ me. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a nice, willing uh, supplicant of a of a laborer. So we, all kinds of things can emerge in the labor market, which which can be rather uh, rather nasty. And the consequence of individual competition in labor markets is, of course, to drive the individual wage down and all the rest of it. So a very class conscious population might kind of say, we don't want more labor markets organized in that kind of way. And controls start to emerge and regulations start to emerge. People kind of say, well, we've got to be an equal opportunity employer. Well, we've got to, you know, we cannot discriminate on the basis of, of sexual preference and all this. You, can say, you, know, you get all of these kind of regulatory things uh, which start, start to come in. But what we see immediately is that it is very much in the interest of capital to keep the labor market segmented, to keep it individualized as much as possible. So when uh, there is some kind of big reform movement which goes on under the, under the control of the International Monetary Fund, almost invariably one of the conditionalities they put on making a loan to some country is to say, we want you to flexibilize your labor. And the flexibility of the labor force means keep it individualized. Don't permit people to sort of hang on to jobs who don't deserve to be there. There should be free hiring and firing. So the conditions in the labor market are a matter of political contestation. They're also a matter of political contestation uh, over gender issues, over racial issues, and all the rest of it. So when you enter into the labor market, what kind, of, what kind of impression do you get of the world? What kind of theory do you come up with? What kind of political thinking do you come up with? Do you come out saying, well, I like uh, this idea of having individual uh, competition because you know, I'm highly educated and I've got, you know, I've got all the way around, I'm skilled and all this kind of thing and I'm going to do very well. So, I, uh, you know, so, so, uh, so, so you will find uh, sort of uh, well-educated students, for example, will kind of say they believe in having individualized uh, labor markets because they figure they can do very well by it. On the other hand, if you come from another kind of background, you might kind of say, look, I would rather have a regulated uh, uh, labor market. Uh, so the labor market question uh, is, I think, very important and because it has a very important political impact as to what kind of society we're going to, to, to enter into. How are, are people going to re respond uh, to the labor market situation? How do they start to think politically uh, about the labor market itself? But then once they start to think politically about the labor market itself, they will take that view of society into how they behave uh, in the labor process, how they behave uh, in consumer markets, how they behave as monetary managers, and even how they behave uh, at the, the point of social reproduction. So that whole world of experience in the labor market is, is not innocent 
in relationship to the kind of political subjectivity that people develop and the kind of political subjectivity with which they enter into the, the world of actually working. Now, in the workplace, clearly one of the big things here is that the laborer is working under uh, the domination of capital. So that in the labor process, uh, there is a foundational moment, which is a class relation, which is very different from the individual relation that, that occurred in the, in, in the labor market. So there's a class relation, and clearly a class relation. The boss has the power to hire and fire. The boss tells you what to do. The boss gets the surplus value. The boss actually says to me, if you want enough money to live on, that is uh, what, what we call necessary labor, if you want enough money to live on, then the only way which you're going to do that is to deliver me a surplus, which is going to be the surplus value, which is going to be the basis of my profit. In other words, you're going to have to work in such a way as to secure my profit. And there's a class relation of exploitation, and it's clearly there. But there is a very interesting kind of issue. How do I relate to my fellow workers? Now, that is where the experience of the uh, labor market starts to come in. Do I actually kind of say to my fellow workers, OK, look, all of us here are existing under the domination of this capitalist. We should be organizing and have solidarity and all the rest of it together. But that might be difficult to do if it turns out that half of the workers in the, that have been hired are, are, are Hungarian and speak Hungarian immigrants. And by the way, they, they uh, work together and, uh, and, and, and are solidarity with each other, but they exclude everybody else. So the, the kind of question of social relations uh, within the labor process comes into it. And again, it is not how the, all, the, the labor market is organized is not innocent of how uh, the labor process is experienced in terms of relationships with co-workers. Now, the, I've already mentioned that it could work the other way around, that the solidarities which come out uh, of uh, this experience of working for capital uh, and, uh, and, and, and the class solidarities that come out lead into uh, a, a, a crusade, if you like, to reorganize uh, the, the labor market in such a way uh, that it does not fragment and that it, do, it does not destroy solidarities and, and the like. So the two moments are related to each other, but they're radically different in their structure. The labor market is individualized in its structure, and basically uh, the worker at that point takes on a very distinctive role, which is the role of seller of commodity. And as a seller of commodity, you know, you're trying to get the best bargain you can and you're selling it individualistically. So the role of seller of commodity as an individual conflicts with the role of labor working on a project under the, the direction and domination of, 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 of capital. So we have, as it were, a bifurcation of political consciousness. One is about solidarity, one the other is about individualism. Now, what about the wage point? That's an interesting point. Once you've got your wages and you're in, in the money, you go out there, you've got money. And you're free to do what you like with it. And when that happens, there is an immediate kind of question of, well, uh, you know, who is going to do the money management? And what does the money management look like? Uh, is the worker sophisticated enough uh, to, to play with this money, or will they be ripped off by, you know, by all kinds of uh, slick people who kind of uh, offer them this or that? Uh, will they uh, invest in uh, insurance? Will they invest in, will they put money aside for a pension? Will they do all these kinds of things? All, all, all these, these questions, again, and, and again, there's an, an issue, uh, will I do that as an individual? Or will there be collective institutions, collective organizations? For instance, one of the things that grew up very early on uh, in, in Britain with the uh, workers coming together was mutual aid societies. And everybody realized there could be crises of various kinds. 
and therefore there was a, a mutual aid society where people would give a little money to this mutual aid society and it would help out those who were having difficulty and, and it was a kind of a form of social insurance. And these led, of course, into, into unions. Unions would, would uh, form questions of solidarity and the unions would then try to organize workplaces and try to organize labor markets. We would also try to organize uh, the way in which uh, the workers, once they had money in their pockets, uh, they could be protected from uh, scams and all these kinds of things, which which are likely to go on. Uh, so, so uh, again, but the consciousness at this point is the consciousness of somebody who is in control of money. And having control of the money is a certain form of social power. And that form of social power can be used in all sorts of ways. It's going to be used in the market in terms of what the selection of commodities is going to be. But also the person who has the money in their pocket is very frequently the person that dominates in terms of certain things going on uh, in the point of social reproduction. So the money, you know, the money evil, if you like, has all kinds of pernicious effects throughout this thing, but at the same time, it is a form of power which exists latently, at least, within the working person's purview. And as such, it becomes politically important so to say, okay, maybe if I can get more money, more money, more money. And further than that, I may also find that, that actually I, I can start to, to play games within the money markets. I can borrow money. Okay, I, I, can, I can save money, I can borrow money. If I have a hard time, I have to borrow money. And, 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 and that means, you know, what somebody heard on the news today was kind of saying, what were they going to do when the unemployment benefits run out at the end of the month? Uh, how will they live? Because they have no resources. They said, well, that's what credit cards are for. So, you know, the credit card industry comes in as well. So there's a very there's a very important monetary moment where people start to become concerned about their monetary well-being, their monetary welfare, uh, their monetary capacities, their monetary possibilities, and at the same time capital comes in and tries to organize the money in a way. And uh, Marx kind of points out the capital also to the degree that workers take care of their old age and take care of the capital says, well I don't have to be responsible for it, they should be responsible for it for themselves. So there's a moment there in which, as money managers, uh, they have a, uh, have, you know, they have, uh, they're in control of a form of social power, and how they use that social power uh, becomes critical. How they use it against others, how they use it in the domestic realm, how they use it in general, all of these, all these questions start to, 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 to come out. Now, when they take the, the, the question to, when they, they go into the market and they go to the grocer and they buy the commodities and all those kinds of things, uh, at that point they are taking on the role of seller. Uh, sorry, they're taking on the role of buyer. So notice what's happened here. Uh, they started off by taking on the role of seller, they were selling labor power. They then become uh, actively involved in the, in the production process. They then come in control of the universal form of value, which is money, and, and all the money power that goes with the control of that money, and they now become a buyer. And as a buyer, they have a certain kind of, of politics available to them. Uh, and and there, is a, there is a struggle at, the, at this point, because as a buyer, uh, you're confronting a seller, and the seller is the capitalist, and the capitalist wants to maximize their profit as a seller. The seller, in the same way they want to maximize the value or they, they get out of you in, 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 in employing you in production. So the seller uh, is, 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 is there and will try to recuperate as much as possible from you in terms of trying to get your wages back. And, and of course, what you've got here is the famous example of the company store, uh, kind of motion. And Marx actually talks about that and kind of says, well, actually. In, in a way, the class relationship between capital and labor is that of a, a company store where uh, the worker works to produce commodities which go into the company store and, and they're then 
uh, go and get their back the commodities they themselves have, have, have produced. So there's a sort of company store relation there. But there's an order of exploitation which goes on uh, in, in the relationship between buyers and, 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 and sellers. Uh, consider, for example, the pharmaceutical companies uh, in the United States. Uh, they've been profiteering like crazy, selling opioids and selling all kinds of noxious kind of things. And you look at the TV ads for the different uh, things which, which you're supposed to use to clear up your skin or, or get rid of a fungus or I don't know, whatever it is. So there's a tremendous amount of possible exploitation which goes on at, at this relationship. But notice at this point, you're looking at the relationship uh, between uh, buyers and sellers. But you as a working person are not the only buyer. You as a working person are not the only person in control of money. You as a working person are uh, actually alongside of many other people who control money. Uh, you are alongside of many other buyers. And to the degree that there is some conflict at, the, at, at any of these points, you're likely to find yourself in alliance with various other factions. For example, as a working person, uh, you may want to have a, a savings uh, structure which is going to pay reasonably well and give you a reasonable rate of return to protect you in your old age. In other words, you want to have reasonable pension arrangements. Well, but there are many other people who want reasonable pension agents, uh, state employees and all the rest of it. Uh, you know, they're, uh, they, they, they want them too. So those, these, these areas are, are actually collective areas where you are one person amongst many, and, and, but you're also one person who's no longer uh, uh, actually uh, uh, approaching the world from the standpoint of a working person. You're approaching the world from the standpoint of buyer. And Marx has a very interesting kind of comment when he's talking about this. He says, actually, what happens at this moment when the working person is buying things in the market is you actually extinguish their character as a worker. They no longer think of themselves as workers, they think of themselves as buyers, and they think of themselves as, as, as trying to maximize how, what they can get uh, for their money, and they're trying to deal with the tendency of the sellers to cheat and fraud and all this kind of stuff and sell inferior products and, and, and all the rest of it. So there, there is something going on at this point of, uh, of the circulation process which is radically different from what goes on at the point of production and is radically different from what goes on in, in, in labor markets because in labor markets you're operating as a seller, here you're operating as a buyer. And then that brings you, if you like, once you get back to, to, to the kind of question of what goes on uh, in the uh, point of social reproduction and the reproduction of labor power. How do you, how do you get all of that uh, all of those commodities back and, and, and what does it mean to, to bring back all of that bundle of commodities as opposed to another bundle of commodities. And I've already mentioned the idea that there's a good deal of consumer choice which is involved here. I mean, the, the market works on the idea of wants, needs and desires backed by ability to pay. Well, the problem for many of the working people is that they don't have very much ability to pay, but they still have plenty of wants, needs, and desires. And so the state of wants, needs, and desires plays a very important role in defining and what happens uh, in, in, in the commodity market. <clears throat> so here we have this situation, which I think is a fascinating one, <clears throat> politically. Because if you say, what goes on in these different moments and, and to what degree do people draw political conclusions and political ideas from the experience of those moments? Let's come back to the moment of social reproduction. Uh, it is interesting. When I was uh, working uh, some with uh, uh, on the, on, the, on the Lordstown uh, question. Uh, in, Lord, in Lordstown, auto workers were being laid off. And these sort of interviews which were done with the, the, the Lordstown workers, well, of course, they talked a lot about what it was like to be an auto worker. 
But it was very clear that many of them uh, really were concerned about family life and family values. And what goes on in the point of social reproduction, many things, forms of conflict, gender conflict, but also gender support, raising kids, all these kinds of things. So it's a complex world. Uh, each one of these moments is in itself a complex world. And it is not determined by any of the other moments, but it is not uninfluenced by all of the other moments. So that, for example, a situation in which the wage which comes is a masculine thing, and the masculine wage, the male wage, is supposed to support the whole household, then you have a kind of different relationship when there are two earners. Uh, there's a gender distinction uh, also in which uh, maybe you know, women may be earning more than the men. So what kind of politics comes out of this? And this is important for, 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 for general political reasons. If you're waging a political campaign, what kinds of issues do you raise? Do you say, I want to support family life? The bourgeois tendency is to always say, we've got to support family. Family values, family values, family values, family values. And if you have good family values, then you'll put up with all kinds of bullshit in the workplace. You'll put up with all kinds of horrible things in, in, in uh, labor markets. You know, you'll put up with all kinds of nasty things happening to you at the point of you know, consumption. Or, or in, you'll put up you put up with the rest of the of the moments because you're intensely happy in your family life, and that's where you get your satisfactions. That's where you get your your, your kicks. And if you find somebody like that, and you say, well, "Look, we've got to reorganise the law, the the labour movement, and we've got to do something about what's going on uh, in terms of uh, occupational safety and health and the, in in the production process because people are dying of." Uh, of uh, exposure to, to noxious chemicals and all the rest of it. If you launch a campaign like that, you may find somebody say, well, I, you know, things are lousy in the labor process, but I can't be bothered because I'm just so happy in my point of reproduction. Uh, other people are unhappy in the point of reproduction and will take it back in another direction. But my point here is, 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 is I think, a very, a very important one politically. We should not presume that working class consciousness is located simply in the labor process. Clearly, the labor process is very important. What happens in the labor process is very important. The social relations experienced in the labor process are terribly important. Yes, that's all. they're all terribly important. But that's not the only part of working a working person's consciousness. Part of it may be shaped by experience in labor markets, which is maybe highly competitive, or it can be segmented and structured and segregated. If, if, if it's any of those things, then I'll come up with another different kind of view. I'll come up with a view which is anti-immigrant or anti-this or anti-anti-black or is anti-women uh, or is, you know, I'll come up with, 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 with a view out of the experience of the labor market uh, which, 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 which kind of say, well, no, this is the real, the real issue here is, 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 is uh, gender equality, not, uh, uh, not, uh, not protection of the workers from noxious fumes in, in, the, in the point of production. So we have to start, if when we ask the kind of question, Marx doesn't do this very much, but I think it's important to do. If we ask the question, what is it that shapes the consciousness of people? And what is it that shapes the consciousness of working people? And they will draw something from each one of those moments. What they draw from each moment depends upon the quality of the experience in that moment. And if the quality of the experience in that moment is, is negative or positive, there's going to be a, a very, very different terrain upon which political action can be organized. Now, I've argued that the moments aren't separate from each other. They affect each other and flow into each other. So if there is a problem in, I don't know, social reproduction, then maybe one of the ways to approach that problem is to start to negotiate things differently at one of the other moments. That is, uh, 
there will be significant impact upon the qualities of, say, family life, of having decent wages with decent social security and decent uh, possibilities. Uh, there are other theories here which work, I think, quite well. Um, again, I don't want to suggest that these actually are always the case, but they can be the case. For instance, Andre Gortz uses the concept of compensatory consumerism, in which basically you say to the workers, okay, put up with dreadful conditions of labor, long work hours, tedious this and tedious that, and, 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 and no, almost no time uh, to think for yourself. Put up with all of that, because at the end of the day, you'll end up with a good wage, and you'll be able to take that wage and, and compensate yourself with a kind of cornucopia of uh, wonderful things uh, uh, that you can buy in, in, the, in consumer markets. So the, the consciousness of, of, of a population are going to be very affected by their differential experiences. And this, of course, is Marx's theory of consciousness formation. And the theory of consciousness formation says you start with some material question, some material experience, and then you ask the question, what ideas, what mental conceptions, what institutional arrangements are likely to org become organized around that experiential world? And in what ways does that experiential world continue to support those mental conceptions, institutional arrangements and the like, and in fact consolidate those institutional arrangements and conceptual and, and, and mental conceptions. In what ways does, it, do, do the, does this happen? And once these ideas become unconsolidated, do they then feed back into this whole kind of structure? To say, uh, for example, that the labor markets should always be flexible. They should always be individualized. The best form of a labor market is an individualized one, because then you will get fairness, because a, a formal market, a free market, is a fair market. And that therefore, uh, there is going to be a campaign waged by the international and multinational institutions and all the bourgeois institutions to say, flexibility of labor is a good thing. It's not only a good thing for capital, it's an excellent thing for everybody who's participating in it. So the idea of flexibility in labor markets becomes uh, actually a crucial part of what the politics is about. But in order to contest that, we have to find people who say, no, there's a different way in which a labor market can be organized. And by the way, it will construct solidarities. And those solidarities, which can be carried over into the world one place of production, can actually then affect the way in which there will be solidarities developed uh, in, 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 cons in consumerism so that, for example, we will have a campaign, an organized campaign to control drug prices. We will have regulations on housing speculation and the like. And we will have regulations uh, on, you know, a regulatory universe. So all of these elements then can be used in relationship to each other. But the important thing I think that Marx is suggesting to us in this relationship is say, think about the, 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 the totality. Think about the circulation process. Study it and understand its qualities in particular situations and then start to use it. And you can start to use it coherently by, by recognizing the fact that people draw their consciousness and their political consciousness and their political subjectivity from a wide range of different experiences. And those different experiences can lead to rather different conclusions. And if you have to uh, deal with that, then once you know that that is the situation, then you'll start to be much more flexible in your approach to people. So, look, I understand why you love having your family life the way it is and why you don't really want to become involved in unionization struggles and all the rest of it. I can understand that why. I, I just want you to realize that the, the, the perpetuation of that condition under which you get adequate uh, income to support that adequate family life depends upon doing something else. So again, having a consciousness of the totality is a, a vital thing and we can, should and must do that in relationship to the understanding of this small circulation process that Marx begins to talk about, which I'm consolidating here, 
in this talk, and that I think has a, a political resonance, which is uh, can I think be utilized in very constructive uh, ways. So let me leave it there, and I hope that uh, we will come back to this kind of question of uh, the circulatory processes, because uh, as I think I have illustrated today, there are some very important things that can be learned from the study of these processes. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.